Salutare, bun găsit din nou la Garantat 100%, scurt și cuprinzător, invitatul nostru este actorul Armand Asante. Hello, thank you so much for accepting this invitation. Thank you for having me, it's uh, great to be back. Back to Cluj, back to Transylvania International Film Festival after 10 years. A sort of 10 years after, to quote the name of a fabulous band. How do you find the place after 10 years? As it appears exactly what I thought, which is I, I believe it's grown three times as to what it was. And it looks that way, it's about three times bigger than it was. Well, that's quite something. And, and also the summer has done some seminal investment in the city of mm -hmm. Cluj because it's obviously under great uh, restoration and renovation. Right. It's a remarkable, very beautiful city. Uh, it, it reeks of the cultural education that it, it emits. So it's very lovely to be surrounded by this uh, kind of energy. It's a very spiritual energy here. I noticed you alone walking around in Cluj just by yourself. With my camera. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm an avid, I, I record everything. <laughs> Let's get back from the very beginning to your family. Father, a painter, an artist. Mother, music teacher and poet. Father of Italian origin, your mother of Irish origin. You are, in a very profound sense, you are a consistent part of the essence of New York. Thank you. Uh, how's that essence living in you right now? I attribute it to my entire uh, miraculous life. I, I've led a very blessed life. I mean, I was surrounded uh, and I was born into a neighborhood of tremendous cultural heritage. And we right. were educated by default. We were taught tolerance from a very, very tiny age. I mean, I was, I was uh, blessed in that I had a lot of tremendous creative spirits around me all my life. And, uh, not, you know, it's it just, uh, I'm, a, I'm a product of osmosis, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, of drinking and all the, that I grew up around. And I, I feel very blessed in that because um, it's endemic to what I'm still doing. I consider this moment to be an adjusted reality of the past moments in right. my life and that nothing is really new, it's just a new adaptation of what I've always done and I thank God that I really love what I do so I, I, I engage totally with mm. the people I work with and uh, I, I thank you for acknowledging that. I was just thinking of the fact that our viewers should know that this recording is early in the morning uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> and it shows. It so shows. They have to know that. Okay. Here's a quotation, an impressive quotation from yourself. You said, "Film is like a microcosm of what the world has to finally reconcile." Yeah. How come? Because I believe that uh, what I think everyone is trying to do with film is create a metaphor for, in a way, the, the very microcosms of their own behavior, society's behavior, a community's behavior. Uh, for instance, in, in the film that Christy Nemensko directed, California Dreaming, yep. which they've re-honored here, um, endemically it's about ro a Romanian cultural issue, but right. this is a global issue, and maybe now even more relevant in terms of what's happening in our world. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the metaphors in that film are very relevant for uh, the global society we live in now. Honestly, do you really think that film can reconcile anything? I think that film, absolutely, because it is universal language, I believe that it, it certainly can illuminate, illuminate people as to what is happening. I think uh, the, the importance of serious film festivals are urgent because there's too much of the unobserved in the world as it is. Mm. So the unobserved filmmakers have a platform, you know. And the miracle of the new digital re revolution, what is mm. digitalized now, is making film available finally. Because 90%, I would say 99% of all films at film festivals are never seen again. That's a fact. They're not distributed, they have no voice. And the platform of film festivals give them young, especially these young filmmakers who really are, most of them, 
talking about very urgent issues within their communities and states and countries. Mm -hmm. so that's why to me it has to be paid attention to as a cultural phenomenon globally. Since we talk about the digital world, let's talk a little bit about technology and content. What happens with this very complex relationship in between technology and content? Is technology a menace to content or is it just the normal path of the human being? I think it's inevitable that we're in an amazing inevitable transition. I think people are using technology mm -hmm. to exploit the medium because that's in essence the, the medium is here, it's in the storyteller, it's in the soul and the hearts and minds of the people and that's what I think is the magic to me, has always been the magic of film I was attracted to the listen, I, I wanted to be the listener, I wanted to be in on this incredibly intimate yeah. situation I think technology however is exploited in film in that people want to use these amazing digital effects that we're coming up with now but I think they tend to they tend to distort the reality of uh, of what storytelling is and yeah, it exaggerates, it uh, embellishes, it magnifies but, it, but the essence of real storytelling is, is from, the, uh, from the souls of the people that create the story Paradise Alley is the first film that made you visible to a consistent audience that happened in 1978. The film is directed and starred by Sylvester Stallone. Did you keep any contact with him? A few times. Uh, I made another film with him in 1994. Judge Dredd. Uh, Judge Dredd. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I'll tell you a funny anecdote but pertaining to that film. Actually, he wrote that film before he wrote Rocky, and they turned it down. He wrote Rocky to compensate for that film. Wow. And then after Rocky came out, they said, OK, you want to direct this little film? You made? Okay. So they gave that to him as a, mm -hmm. as a bonus, you know. But uh, it's a funny, funny anecdote a lot of people don't know. It's a sweet film about three brothers. Two, two. But I noticed you in a few interviews, very fair play, very, a very sporty attitude, because you talk about Sylvester Stallone as about a very talented person oh, yeah. knowing how to deal with the business. Without a doubt, yeah. He, he, um, knew, I knew him when he was very young, he, uh, I think, knew that he had icon, iconic potential, right. but he's also a very talented, remarkably talented guy, and, and a wonderful writer, a uh, wonderful director, he's, he's very um, multi-talented, and he's a very serious athlete, you know, his physique is not an accident, he, I mean, I've observed him, everything he undertakes, whether it's playing golf, or polo, everything that he's undertaking, to the max. And we'll hire the best coaches around to, to uh -huh. get him. I, I really admire that about him. 1990, Nick Tolte, Timothy Hutton, and yourself. What did you profoundly learn from that fabulous character Thank who's you. called Sidney Lumet? Yeah. Lumet taught me and reminded me, because I've always known that, I think, most serious performers and most serious directors know 80 I would say 80 to 90 percent of the film is in the preparation and Lumet was a master at that. Lumet gave you a script in May we rehearsed in September intensively rehearsing on a floor like this with as if we were just doing a stage play yep. and we'd move to room to room with all the props so he really laid out the map of what the physiognomy of the film was going to be like and you knew so, so well you had put that role by then into your DNA. So, I mean, that's the magic of his uh, uh, remarkable career. Uh, because he, every film he did, he did the same way. There was nothing he did differently. Uh, and uh, it was a remarkable uh, lesson and reminder to me that, you know, and I, I say it to young filmmakers and young actors mm -hmm. all the time, prep, you know know your subject, investigate your subject, know every detail, you know, as if you were a lawyer about to go on trial, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what he brought to cinema, and I think that's what his legacy is in New York, the people that did work with him, remarkably, um, it was theater, yeah. and, he, and, he, and he reminded us that it's theater, so treat it like theater. What and how did he ask from you as an actor? 
I mean, he could evoke. Once you gave your performance to him, I remember one day I was stuck, for want of a better word. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't feel it was at a connection. And he, he simply said, try leaning forward two inches. Change the whole dynamic. So, I mean, his experience as, as a gift two inches. director. Two inches. Wow. And it changed the entire dynamic of what was happening. That's just a, a very smart, smart director. And uh, he was renowned for that, but, but he, he had tremendous uh, background in live television, uh, tremendous background in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's a member of the Adler family. His uncle was Jacob Adler, one of the great Israeli uh, Yiddish actors in New York. So um, the, his legacy was uh, determined his career. 1992, Hoffa, directed by Danny DeVito. 1997, The Odyssey, directed by Konchalovsky. Yeah. 2007, American Gangster, directed by Ridley Scott. Three very different personalities, three very different worlds. What is inside you from those three experiences? Well, the three, as you said, they're completely different animals, completely. Um, Ridley Scott is a director who has thought through the film so much. He literally knows where to put the camera and does not communicate so much with the actor. He, uh -huh. he, he hires people he knows will give him exactly what he wants. Um, and then when you see what he's doing, he knows exactly where to put that camera, but not just where to put the camera, but what the camera will emotionally do for the entire scene and for you as an actor. And that has always amazed me when I went to see the film for the first time. Mm -hmm. What struck me was that this man knew exactly where to put that lens. Unlike a lot of directors who took a master, a medium, and a close, and a, maybe an angle or two, yeah. Ridley doesn't waste time doing that. He knows exactly how he wants the geography of the scene emotionally to spell out in the frame. Yeah. Remarkable. Basically, he's a visual artist, as yeah. a matter of fact. Yep. Konsolowski is, uh, is mm -hmm. a, uh, one of the most gifted actors, directors I, I've ever worked with. Aside from having all the other attributes as a, a great, uh, an artist who understands cinematic impact of imagery, how to make a line in a poem yeah. become a film statement, and uh, can literally evoke, pull uh, emotions out of mm -hmm. a, a performer. Remarkable talent for getting in someone's face and really getting into their soul yeah. and pulling it out of them. Uh, I mean, I've seen some of the women on that film that were perplexed as to what to do. He would put them so completely in the zone as a director. I mean, it's, it's, it's a joy to work with somebody this talented. It's uh, really... And, and Danny DeVito and, and Hoffa, you know, it's a funny that that, that film came together um, remarkable group of people he put together. Right. That was a David Mamet script. Right. So we had to follow the script to the letter of the law. Every punctuation mark Isn't this is wonderful. in that film. That's wonderful. Very unusual. Very unusual. And that, and that, that literally is a script by the playwright, David Mamet. And uh, it was filmed as such. It's, very, it's a very theatrical version of, uh, of Hoffa. Right. You know? When you deal with a director who's a very well-known actor, yeah. is there any ego, invisible were in between the director and yourself? I assume there could be. I mean, certainly with somebody like Danny DeVito, one of the most available people on the planet, uh, personally. So, I mean, he's just a lot of fun. He's mm -hmm. a lot of fun to work with. And, and, and he makes it feel like a lot of fun. So, I mean, in, in a sense, that I'm sure it can happen between performers, but no, not, not at all. No. Okay. I noticed in a few interviews that you gave a long time that you mentioned the word intimacy. Mm. Is intimacy still something important, something crucial in order to achieve something fundamentally human? Because we live in a time when the notion of intimacy seems to be doomed to disappear. Mm. That's an interesting question. I mean, um, I feel that intimacy comes from people that very much want to break through the fourth wall and create a zone, right. if you will. 
that uh, allows performers and actors and directors to really work on a level of communication where the script becomes invisible. I don't like to watch anything where I see I'm, I'm watching a script or I'm hearing a script. And then finally, uh, that, that intimacy has to be really transmitted usually from the director to the uh, actor. And, and the director has to, his that principal obligation is to create that zone for performers to work in mm -hmm. where they feel safe. They feel safe in that intimacy and they can explore themselves to the limit within that, yeah. that intimacy. But I think that, that that's one of the great joys of working in film. I love the theater and everything I do in my life is pertaining to what I learned from the theater. But in theater, it's very, very difficult to achieve the kind of intimacy you can in film. But that comes from a director who's creating that zone yeah. for people to work on that level. And that's the magic of when you see something and you forget, mm. you forget you're watching. You're just glued to the screen. It's because you are, you're in that zone with them. That's what a great director does. He breaks down the wall, the fourth wall. How do you secure 